네, 저희 행사 시작 전에 잠시 안내 말씀 드리겠습니다. 저희 잠시 후 7시 30분부터 2021 서울 국제 작가 축제 개막식 시작하겠습니다. 참석자 분들을 위해 장례 착석을 부탁드리고요. 아울러 오늘 원활한 행사 진행을 위해서 갖고 계신 분들의 전화는 지도를 바꾸셨는데 다시 한번 확인해보겠습니다. 오늘 행사는 안전하게 진행이 되고 있습니다. 코로나19 방역수칙에 따라서 진행이 되고 있습니다. 끝까지 마스크 착용을 기억하시고요. 
Keep your facial masks on at all times and practice distancing. This event is being streamed live on the Literature Translation Institute of Korea YouTube channel in Korea and English. So we will be beginning the event shortly. Thank you. Another announcement, repeating the same announcement, at 7.30 we will begin the 2021 SIWF opening ceremony. Please take your seats. Also, as a courtesy for the other participants, please switch your mobile phones to silent mode. This event follows the COVID-19 prevention guidelines, so please keep your facial masks on at all times. This event is being streamed live on the Literature Translation Institute of Korea YouTube channel in Korean and English language. We will begin the ceremony shortly. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. Thank you for all the participants watching the Seoul International Writers Festival online. I am the MC for the opening ceremony, announcer Chang Son Young. Hello, I am the poet Shin Yong Mok, also to MC the opening ceremony. Hello, thank you. Thank you so much. We see so many writers and participants, and it's already such an exciting event. The 2021 Seoul International Writers Festival is hosted by Literature Translation Institute of Korea, Seoul Foundation for Arts and Culture, Seoul Design Foundation, Incheon International Airport Corporation, and sponsored by the Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism. 
It has begun by the LTI Korea in 2006, and this year is a 10th festival. So today, the first part of the event is this opening ceremony, and the second part will feature opening keynote lectures and discussions with the writers Han Gang from Korea and Mariana Enriquez from Argentina. So I hope you will be with us till the end. And also, we have a special lucky draw for the viewers of the online streaming in Korea. For Korean viewers, please screen capture the streaming you are watching from time to time and provide the captured image along with their contact information through the Google Doc template provided at the top of the comments window to have a try at the lucky draw. So I hope that you will get a lot of energy and also so it's all of good luck from the lucky draw. Now, before we kick off the festival, we should find out the theme of the 2021 Seoul International Writers' Festival. So, Mr. Sin, could you tell us the overarching theme of this year's festival? So, I believe it's a very important uh, theme for myself, notwithstanding the pandemic. It's you know, when you're hit by a sudden noise while on the street or suddenly you're reminded where you are and who you are, it's awakening. Well, the word awakening, when I first heard that this would be the theme, I thought that I had to come up with some response that was poetic, but first I was reminded of myself that I might be missing the more important things while I, while I am living my day-to-day -day life. And I hope to see what the participants and the writers will have to say about awakening. So we have inviting, we have invited 33 writers from Korea and abroad, and we will hopefully be able to provide new awakenings. And yes, we have a lot of online participants at the same time. We regret that we aren't able to welcome them here in the hall, but we would like to wave to them on screen. Please wave at the camera. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. So, so many participants are joining us online from around the world. Viewers who join us online are truly big fans of Korean culture and Korea literature. We have students from Sinchon National University Creative Writing Department, Tübingen University in Germany, Nehru University in India, Malaga University in Spain, Inalco in France, and also students studying Japanese translation. So all studying literature. And literature, of course, makes us study life and human beings. So, of course, this is going to be a much more enriching experience. I hope that you will stay with us till the second end of the second part of the event. Now we would like to begin the opening ceremony. And we'll have the opening address and the announcement of the theme of this year. The opening address will be given by President Park hyo Hwan of Literature Translation Institute of Korea. Please give him a big hand and just take the stage. I am Kwak Kyo Hwan, President of Literature Translation Institute of Korea. I'll just take off my mask for just three seconds to say hi. Hello. It's a pleasure to be with you. This year, we celebrate our 10th Seoul International Writers Festival, and my warmest welcome to the writers from Korea and abroad, and of course, fans of literature and all the distinguished guests. World literature and Korean literature are brought together in Seoul International Writers Festival, which was inaugurated in 2006. And we have welcomed from 54 countries 240 writers to share an exchange with, with each other and with readers. Regretfully enough, because of the COVID-19 pandemic since last year, most of our programs are being delivered online. However, in the midst of all these difficulties, we will not be able to stop 
writers from exchanging with each other and also readers. And we are delivering this program and festival online, and this belies the strength of literature. Last year, the festival had hosted the Italian writer Paolo Giordano. I remember reading in his essay, How Contagion Works, that the contagion is an invitation to think. And the quarantine in which we postpone our activity is the opportunity to do so. This year's overarching theme is awakening. In an extended effort from last year, in the face of the still unfamiliar and disturbing invitation extended by the COVID-19 pandemic, what are we awakened to and what is a way forward for literature? These questions will be discussed by the participating writers and shared in diverse ways with the readers. The entire world is waging this very trying war against the coronavirus, but still just like we see flowers blossom, the wind blow, and people finding love nevertheless as we take each day at a time, we open the festival as we had faithfully for the last nine times. At the beginning of this year's Seoul International Writers Festival, I would like to share Come to the Orchard in Spring by the Persian poet Jalaluddin Muhammad Rumi. Come to the orchard in spring. There is light and wine and sweethearts in the pomegranate flowers. If you do not come, these do not matter. If you do come, these do not matter. Come to the 2021 Seoul International Writers Festival. There is awakening and thinking and sharing. If writers and readers do not come, these do not matter. If writers and readers do come, these do not matter. With my deepest appreciation and thanks for all those who have worked so hard to make the festival take place, I declare the opening of the 10th Seoul International Writers' Festival. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Park. And uh, he is a very well-known poet in Korea, and he's also a researcher in Korean literature. And he usually cites Korean poetry, but uh, since becoming the president of LTI Korea, he has started citing uh, foreign poetry as well. Uh, so this was very interesting to see. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Park, uh, for that. Uh, yes, we are in a very challenging times, but uh, we also want to see uh, a time when we can enjoy flowers and songs uh, more after the pandemic. Now, we will hear the uh, video message from Mr. Hwang Hee, Minister of Culture, Sports and Tourism. Warm greetings to you all. As was introduced, I am Hwang Hee, Minister of Culture, Sports and Tourism. I would like to extend my congratulations on successfully organizing the 10th Seoul International Writers' Festival. Our stories, written using the Korean alphabets, are being recognized as valuable assets in the world of contents. This is in large part thanks to the efforts of LTI Korea and festivals like SIWF. But even more so, it is testament to the endeavors of writers. And for that, I am very grateful. Literature have, has always helped us make sense of this world, and it has the power to transcend the present time. Writers of literature from different countries and cultures have gathered today. The fact that writers can exchange views and readers get a chance to converse with the writers they love uh, makes this festival a very meaningful event. Ladies and gentlemen, the theme this year is awakening the encounter with another human being and with another world is where awakening and change begin. I believe SIWF will provide a wonderful opportunity for that encounter. Thank you very much.
네, 감사합니다. Thank you very much, Minister, for your kind words. 네, so I'm a poet, and as the minister was speaking, I was thinking about perhaps that means more budget for next year's festival, because he's very interested and in supportive of this festival, and many people are sharing and exchanging in this festival despite their different nationalities. And in the journey towards the beautiful um, sharing, I hope that we will find new awakenings. Next, we will have some congratulatory remarks from the CEO of the Seoul Design Foundation, Mr. Yi Kyung-dun. I am Yi Kyung-dun of Seoul Design Foundation. So listening to Mr. Kwa Chuan, President of LTI Korea, and also listening to the remarks of Mr. Hwang Hee of Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism, I was trying to come to an awakening on what I could talk about. So I'm not a very eloquent speaker, but I would like to extend my thanks to the many writers who are filling this space with literature and culture. So I do have a prepared speech to read, but I choose not to read it because President Kwok's speech was so impressive and he has already spoken all of the words that I wanted to say, but I would like to make a commitment to all those present. The thoughts and writings will, are filling up our minds. However, the space is filled by the participants. So I hope that you will visit this space often and make good use of these spaces. And I hope that your stories will resonate from this space throughout the world. Seoul International Writers Festival, my most heartfelt congratulations on the opening of this event, and I will do my utmost to better support the event. I would like to extend my thanks to all of those who made this event possible, and I hope the best luck and success to the end of the event. Thank you. And thank you very much, Mr. Lee. So, when we think about design, we usually think of visual design. But the Seoul Design Foundation is one of the hosts of this festival, and so they are also helping design our uh, minds. This is a place where we can exchange views and opinions, but at the same time we're exchanging hearts and minds. Now we will invite one of the SIWF's planning committee members onto the stage. Uh, it is none other than poet Sun Tek Su. Please welcome Mr. Sun with a warm round of applause. I am Sun Tek Su, a member of the organizing committee of SIWF 2021. Hello, welcome to SIWF 2021. In Korea, there is a saying, there is meaning even in a momentary brush against a stranger. So it seems to me that to have this meeting of writers and readers from around the world during this pandemic is of seismic significance. It is a sprout shooting through the fossilized stratum of language. In one of his travels abroad, Jean Cocteau apparently ran into Charlie Chaplin on a boat in the South China Sea. The two artists immediately recognized one another and attempted a conversation to no avail. Why? They did not speak the same language. Someone volunteered to serve as the interpreter, but Chaplin quietly intervened. 
the complete inability to exchange a single word, a situation where no interpretation is possible, was actually intensifying the desire for engagement in Chaplin's view, and he said it was helping them focus more intensely on the welcoming expressions, which was a wonderful experience, and was helping them connect to each other's inner person. The language barrier that had divided Chaplin and Cocteau had actually connected them together and supported their exchange. I hope that SIWF 2021, by recognizing the barriers, deeply thinking about them and raising questions, to experiment what is possible with literature for further meaningful practice. Festivals organized by a public agency comes with certain limitations, such as the intrusion by a hegemonic entity, but it also has the benefit of effectively bringing together people in a broad-based conversation. The writers, readers, and the viewers, you are the soul of this festival. And you make this festival special. In closing, I would like to thank Mr. Kim Sa-in, a poet and the former president of LTI Korea, and also its current president, Mr. Kwak Hyo-han, also a poet, and all the members of the LTI Korea and the planning uh, of the organizing committee for your contributions. Thank you very much, Mr. Sun. I live in Gwangju, and uh, I haven't met Mr. Sun for a long time. But actually, I ran into one of his family members, and so we talked a lot about Mr. Sun behind his back. But uh, having heard his message just now, I regret having talked behind his back. But anyhow, it uh, is grateful to have uh, this opportunity to hear directly from the poet Sun Tek Su. You know, um, all of the speeches have been just wonderful coming from all of the writers. Now, although we were not able to invite a lot of people to uh, be here at the venue, but we also have writers who has very warm wishes for a great festival. Yes, we have messages from writers from around the world, uh, about 260, almost 300 writers uh, are joining us and have good wishes for this festival. So we will hear from these writers. Good day. My name is Denja Abrilai. I'm a poet, writer, and a playwright from Nigeria. I attended the Seoul International Writers Festival in 2014. It was a thrilling experience meeting with Korean writers, getting introduced to Korean writings and the culture of the people. And I came back from that experience enriched. I wrote a lot of poems, essays, and articles about that visit. And I particularly at this present moment wish the organizers of the Seoul International Writers Festival a happy 10th anniversary. Thank you. Hello, I am Kim Edem. The season has come for the Seoul International Writers Festival. Congratulations to all the participating writers. I took part in the festival back in 2010 and had a wonderful time and made friends with other writers. Especially memorable is how I met the American poet Johannes Joransson. And thanks to him, I had my poetry book, Hysteria, published by Action Books. This year is the 10th festival. I wish you all an enriching, engaging, and meaningful festival. Thank you. Hello, I am Florence Noivier, a French writer. So, International Writers' Festival left me with a very profound and agreeable impression. Meeting my colleagues, Korean writers, was incredible. 
but meeting with the readers, so many readers filled with youth, motivation, and hunger for the lecture and literature, all of it was a feast, a grand festival of the spirits. I don't know how to say it in Korean. The festival of the spirits, a gift for the mind. Thank you. Hello, my name is Hwang jong -un and I'm a novelist. My warm wishes to everyone at the SIWF 2021, a writer's festival that connects Korean literature to the rest of the world. This year's theme, Awakening, is truly a compelling one for us living on this small planet beset by a persistent pandemic. I hope all of the participating writers will be able to form wonderful friendships. Best wishes to you all. I'm so grateful to the Seoul International Writers Festival and my encounter with so many great Korean poets, including Kim Sa-in, Moon Chang yi Jung Rae Choi, Ko Hyung Ryol, Kang Yun Gyo, Shim Bo Seon, Park Sang Yang and Kim Hai Sun and Jung Sung Tai and the translator scholar Yun Gui Chung. I hope to keep reading more translations of terrific Korean writers. Hi, this is Srilata Krishnan from Chennai, India. I have had the honor of participating in the Seoul International Writers Festival back in 2012. That was perhaps the most wonderful moment of my life as a writer. Never before and never after have I seen a festival of that kind. Many congratulations to the team at SIWF for pulling this off and all good wishes for your 10th edition. Lots of love, bye and thank you. Hello, I am Hei Su, a novelist. Congratulations on the 10th anniversary of SIWF. I've been a writer for 21 years, and in those years, the thing that brought me greatest joy was participating in SIWF. And the best thing I did was being a part of the SIWF organizing uh, committee. Writers are professionals who do their writing alone in their rooms. But first and foremost, we are the voices that reach out to multitudes. I hope that the exchange of ideas at the festival will in some way add to the wonderful job you are doing as writers. Frankly, I had all my wishes come true after taking part in the festival. I wish for all of you to experience the same magic I have. My warmest support will be with the festival. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm round of applause to the past participants of SIWF. Mr. He said that his wishes all came true after participating in the festival. So I think that uh, bodes very well for all the participants here today. Uh, I think uh, we will see some wishes coming true later on. Yes, uh, all of my wishes are just running through my brain right now. Now we have met the past participants of this year uh, of SIWF. So now we want to meet the participating writers for this year including Mr. Shin Young Mok. There are writers from abroad uh, who will be uh, joining this festival. So we will meet them on video. First of all, from Singapore, Amanda Chong. From Israel, David Grossman. From Russia, Evgeny Vodolaskin. From China, Go Shui-ping. From Germany, Jan Wagner. From US, Ken Liu. Next, from Norway, Maya Lunde. From Argentina, Mariana Enriquez. 
From US, Matt Ruff. From UK, Max Porter. From Syria, Nuri Al Jara. From Morocco, Rim Batal. From Ireland, Sean Hewitt. From Denmark, Siri Ranva Yam Jakobsen. Next is from Australia, Trent Dalton. From France, Vanessa Springora. And from Korea, Ko Jae Jung. Also from Korea, Park Jae Sik. Also from Korea, Kim Ki Chang. From Korea, Kim Sum. And next, also from Korea, Kim Yeon Soo. From Korea, Kim Jung Mi. And uh, this person is actually standing right next to me, Mr. Shin Yong Mo from Korea. And uh, we saw her on Zoom just before, uh, An Hee Yeon. And Yu Ge Yong also from Korea. And um, from Korea, Yoon Go Eun. From Korea, Yi Mi Ye. Also from Korea, Yi So Yeon. From Korea, Yi Hyun Seok. From Korea, Lee Hee Young. Again, from Korea, Choi Yoon. From Korea, Choi Jin Young. And last but not least, from Korea, Han Kang. So we have uh, many writers who are taking part in this festival, although we were not able to invite all of them to be physically present here at the venue, but we have a couple of writers who are online. So we are going to uh, meet these writers. We have uh, joining us uh, from US, Mr. Matt Roth. We are going to ask him how he feels uh, being a part of the festival. Hello. Well, it, this is wonderful. Uh, you know, it, it is an honor and a pleasure to be part of the festival. And um, while that would be true, I think in any year, uh, it's, it's a particular pleasure for me in this strange pandemic time we're living in. Um, one of the things that has made this last year and a half bearable for me uh, is events like this one that just remind me that there is still a wider world out there and uh, people who care about books and storytelling as much as I do. And it's, it's just really nice to be able to engage in a bit of fellowship with them. Um, and I am sorry that I, I can't be there in person. Um, I do look forward to a time, I hope when life goes back to normal and uh, perhaps I can visit Korea in person and Maybe the next time we do this, uh, it'll all be in the same room together and and in the same time zone. And uh, but for now, this is this is still quite wonderful, and uh, I'm very grateful to to be allowed to participate. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for those kind words. Mr. Matt Ruff just said that, of course, when writers meet, it's a meeting of the spirits and the souls, and we will look forward to meeting in person as well. Now, of course, we have to listen to some words from a Korean writer. I'd like to invite Ms. Kim Jung Mi. Could we hear some words on how it feels to be part of this. Hello, I'm Kim Jung Mi. I write children and young adult literature. And thanks to the International Festival, I was able to talk with Lee Hee Yeon and Maya Runde and Trent Dalton through this festival. Of course, we only had to, only got to meet virtually. However, 
speaking to each other virtually, we were able to share what we wanted to share with young people and discuss our viewpoints and found that our concerns for young people were quite similar. And in that discussion, we could all see that literature is such a consolation and it will open new doors that will get us beyond this isolation and these difficulties. It was such a great awakening for myself and thank you for that opportunity. Thank you. Please give her a big hand. So listening to the two writers, I see what a great honor it is for myself to be standing here and seeing this event. Through this link of literature, we can be together, and it's such an important experience. So today we are kicking off this series of events within the festival, so I hope that you will enjoy all of the programs till the end. So that brings us to the end, to the opening ceremony of the 2021 Seoul International Writers Festival. What's next after this ceremony? Yes, right after the opening ceremony, we will go straight into the opening keynote lecture by the writers Han Kang and Mariana Enriquez right here. I will be sitting in the audience enjoying it myself. So tomorrow, we will also begin the one-on-one -on -one talks between writers on interesting topics on contemporary society and writers in conversation brings together writers from different corners of the world to discuss global issues, novel and poetry readings, and also a 10th festival anniversary commemorative film screening is in the working as well. All the programs are available for watching on the official website of SIWF. Also, if you book in advance through Naver, you will get to enjoy the programs a minute they are open. Thank you. That brings us to the end of the opening ceremony of 2021 Seoul International Writers Festival. Thank you for watching, and please enjoy the second part, the opening le lecture. And this is where I bid you goodbye. I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Hello once again. Welcome to the opening keynote lecture session of SIWF. I am Shin Yong Mok. I'm a poet and I will serve as the moderator for this session. The organizers probably had me uh, for to serve as the moderator because, you know, um, I could probably make the environment a little bit more comfortable. Uh, now, the first SIWF was in 2006, and this is the 10th. True to its title, SIWF is an international celebration of literature where writers read each other works and exchange views on various issues. This year, the theme is awakening, and we will talk about what we've learned during this pandemic and how we must chart a new way forward based on our shift in perception and the life-changing experiences we have undergone. Uh, and most of the events are being held virtually. We will kick off with the opening keynote lectures by our two guest writers on the theme Awakening and have a conversation afterwards. Let us first listen to the keynote by the Korean writer Han Gang. So let me invite uh, Han Gang to the stage. So, the writer is published The Vegetarian Human Acts and I Do Not Bid Farewell. And she has received numerous awards, including the Yisang Literary Award, Hwang Sunan Literary Award, and Man Booker International Prize and the Malaparte Prize. We please hear her keynote lecture. Please give her a big hand as she takes the microphone. Hello. 
One summer afternoon last year, I met up with my publishers in town after submitting the final manuscript of a novel that had taken me a long time to write. Walking down the street alone on my way back, I became overwhelmed by a strong sense of reality. Writing a full-length novel involves living in two different worlds over many years and striking a balance between the two. You must delve into the fictional world every day while keeping your eyes and ears peeled for the real world. Yet, as a balance between the two collapsed and fiction ebbed, out of my life like low tide, I was left all, all alone in the midst of reality. It was over 35 degrees Celsius with humidity levels of almost 80%. As usual, I had a face mask on which only made it feel even warmer. The passers-by on the street were in the same boat. With only our eyes left visible and sensing the unbearable heat that we all suffered, we scurried past each other towards our respective destinations. Among the faces covered with masks, the sweat and suffocating heat coming off each person and the sufferings, we were wary of each other's breath. After nearly two years of the coronavirus pandemic, we are now familiar with a number of words and terms whose meanings have gone from vague to vivid. Confirmed case, infection rate, fatality rate, variant, epidemiological investigation, herd immunity, self-isolation, cohort isolation, shutdown, mRNA vaccines, receptors, therapies, and antibodies. Our daily lives are swamped with scenes as strange as such terminology. Images of healthcare workers covered head to toe in protective suits have been seen on the news. In the early days of the pandemic, people queued outside pharmacies to purchase publicly distributed face masks limited to two per person per week. Whenever cluster infection broke out, long lines of people waited to get tested at screening centers. Each day, we were informed of the coordinates of schools, hospitals, and stores being shut down, and came across the stories of those who passed away, survived, or went into self-isolation. We heard the voices of those pained by their inability to see their loved ones in hospital, as well as those burdened with the task of caring as remote work and online learning became the new norm. Weddings were postponed. Funerals attended by no visitors felt abrupt and forlorn. News of layoffs and termination of contracts, struggles and closures of private businesses, industrial accidents, suicides and despair, spread at a frightening speed, comparable to that of the virus. The pandemic is still ongoing, and nobody knows when it will end. As difficult as it is to believe, perhaps there is no end to it. With my mind full of such complicated thoughts, I kept walking in silence until I stopped before an old sign hanging in one corner of the street. It said, you'll find a way in books. I was almost mesmerized by that sentence written in old-fashioned font under the name of a used bookstore, and I walked in there. Is it true? I asked myself. Will we really find a way in books? I was welcomed by the penetrating smell of old books that instantly evoked nostalgia. Apparently exhausted by the heat, the masked owner of the bookstore sat in front of an electric fan without even looking up or saying hello. I walked between jam-packed bookcases and disorderly piles of books. Old electric fans here and there worked fiercely to protect the books from humidity. Surrounded by numerous books that had made up or passed through my life, not to mention well-known books by deceased authors, I thought to myself, 
I don't think I'll find a way here. However, I stumbled upon some back issues of the bi-monthly ecological magazine Green Review, which had persistently warned of the crisis of humanity for over two decades, a bizarre sense of unreality came upon me, as if I had been traveling back in time. After paying for one of them, I took a subway during the evening rush hour and walked along the road that gave off heat even after sunset. I stopped by my favorite local bookstore and picked out several new publications that were relevant to the subject of the book that I just bought. The next few days were spent going through the pages of those books. The books all issued warning. If we fail to stop global warming caused by carbon emissions by 2030, the deadline of catastrophe of mankind will be hastened from 2050 to 2040, with scientific calculations being revised every year. There is 24% chance the ecological catastrophe will begin around 2030, just nine years later. That catastrophe is not likely to present one grand apocalyptic spectacle. Rather, it will bring about a series of frequent and increasingly powerful typhoons, droughts, heavy rains, fires, rising sea levels, and shortages of food and water. Ordinary people will lose their jobs and homes, and innocent lives will be lost or torn apart due to conflicts, wars, and large-scale epidemics. The socially disadvantaged will be sacrificed first, and eventually a painful end will be in store for all. The coronavirus pandemic, which has been haunting the entire world for nearly two years, is only the prelude to the process that is already underway. As days passed, the heat wave subsided. One day at dawn, I put down my book and went out to the riverside, ringing with the sounds of bugs in late summer. Cool morning breezes gently caressed my forearms bare below the short sleeves. Then I was struck by a sudden realization. I love this world with the seasons changing from summer to autumn and then from autumn to winter. A world where stoop-shouldered elderly ladies stroll along the riverside, young people go for a run in the morning, and the same young woman in a helmet energetically pedals her bicycle past me around the same time every day. A world where the morning sunshine streaming through tree leaves forms bright spots of light flickering across the sidewalk. A world where babies babble and turn over for the first time. A world where people exchange warm glances, handshakes, and hugs. A world devoid of another, more terrifying catastrophe. A world which is not yet completely destroyed by mankind and thus provides a temporary haven for us mortal beings amidst the beauty of this planet. Many species of living things have already been wiped out and at this rate, all including humanity, is said to be annihilated. I pondered upon the present times that we were passing through at the edge of the carbon civilization, and I asked myself, has this collective experience of abrupt social isolation and struggle paradoxically created a great sense of connection? Fear, helplessness in the face of uncertainty, the wish to shake hands and see the face beneath the mask, the desire to escape from the prison of personal circumstances and form solidarity, consideration of what mankind has destroyed so far, and appreciation of Persian things that we do not want to lose anymore. Have we not collectively experienced all of this? I then rephrased the question I had previously asked myself in front of the old bookstore about whether we'd find a way in books to will we find a way in literature. It occurred to me that the word way might not refer to a quick, clear solution or conclusion, and that perhaps implied in it was the power of a certain attitude. 
If there is a way in literature, it won't be a line drawn across a smooth surface as a mark, but a space with profound depth. Literature can start from a single line in the newspaper, a remark overheard on the street, a photograph, or a fragment of a dream, memory of, or premonition. Curves, depths, and interiors can be imagined and discovered from seemingly flat events, objects, and characters. When moments of awakening beneath that depth ignite and shine like electric sparks, the currents of life start flowing inside those of us reading. The moment that power of life gives rise to a hollow path, a new attitude in your body and mind, your life will subtly or decisively change so you can never return to your old self before the reading experience. How easily and quickly a service without depth slips into hatred, discrimination, prejudice, and violence we've already witnessed. As we read literature, the depth of the hollow road that emerges puts a break on that. Sometimes, when we sink into despair, disillusionment, and helplessness, thinking that there's nothing we can do, those rugged inner roads decelerate our resignation before helping us make a sudden turn. When our most precious values are threatened, they often lead us to form solidarity as a way of providing protection. Everyone has realized that the fates of all living things dwelling upon this planet are inevitably connected, that awakening and connection is made deeper and more alive by the power of literature, and the way that power pushes us forward is the thought I have arrived at. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hangang, for that lecture. So there are no adverbs or adjectives that can be used to summarize such a writing. And so many ideas are flowing over my being, and I am lost within all of those ideas. I would like to introduce the next speaker. It is Mariana Enriquez. Uh, she made her literary debut in her teens with Bahar Es Lo Peor, and her story collection, The Dangers of Smoking in Bed, was shortlisted for 2021 International Booker Prize. She was awarded Premio Heralde and the Premio Celsius. Now, let's hear from Mariana Enriquez. Please welcome Ms. Enriquez with a warm round of applause. The room. I experienced a blackout shortly after the outbreak of the pandemic. It was more like a restless dream than a blackout. I often look for ideas for fiction, literature, and writing in my mind's room. The light went out and it fell into darkness. Since the room had not always been brightly lit, I was not worried in general. Sometimes it was unbearably bright, and sometimes a single lamp hanging from the ceiling moved ever so subtly to illuminate the corners of the room. At any rate, the light had always been there. In the wake of the pandemic in March 2020, the room went dark. I couldn't find the light switch. Each time I brought in a candle, the flame would go out. Matches, lighters, flashlights, and the cold light of my cell phone all proved useless. I wondered then if the room would ever wake up. I was not afraid of losing my ability to write. Rather, I feared uncertainty, the nearness of death, the anguish in the air, and the suffocating ambience, amidst which I couldn't even name the threat. 
Many people said to me, how strange. Someone who writes about horror and death is paralyzed and switched off. Shouldn't it be the other way around? Not strange at all, I thought. Those of us who write about death and fear try to figure out those terrors. We feel them just like everyone else. It's only that we choose to dissect and examine each and every emotion. In addition, during those uncertain first months of the pandemic, I was constantly asked whether the situation resembled my writing. No, not at all. And how I would define the virus. People wondered if I was ever going to write about a deadly, uncontainable disease. I thought, I can't write, I can't think, I just have to get through this. All the questions left me dumbfounded, all the traumas, all the fears. What will happen to humanity? What should I make of humanity? And what does that mean? Why think of the new normal when the pandemic is still raging, at least in Argentina? All the words I heard, all those opinions, data, metaphors, suggestions, Instagram, Instagram Live, and the continuity of virtual format activities, wasn't the intensity of all that pure terror? What pool were they trying to cover? Were they trying to create a kind of extinction fantasy? I thought of insects escaping from the hand that held poison or the shoe that would crush them. The cockroach would run and manage to hide behind the washing machine if it got lucky. I felt like I'd just been in a car accident. I saw smoke coming out of the engine and smelled something burning. I didn't know if there had been an explosion. My body had yet to detect the pain caused by the recent blow. From the other side of the window, some 20 people bombarded me with questions. Are you going to get a new car? Will you be able to get this one fixed? Do you think your life will ever be normal again after your leg amputation? Did the people in the other car survive? If not, would you be willing to pay their funeral expenses? Was your son in the seat next to you wearing a seatbelt? That's how it went every day. The light went out, although the room was always there waiting for me. I was even more concerned about the slow disappearance of my writing companions, my ghosts, my characters, my protagonists, my colleagues, and my obsessions. Actually, they never left. They merely became transparent, like phantoms. It was very difficult to make them talk, move, or feel. Where does the light of the creative impulse come from? For me, it comes from everywhere. Since I was a child, I've had mysterious obsessions, often lasting for months or years. I've been obsessed with actors, films, colors, stories, artists, paintings, art, music, and musicians. Music never once left me. In the worst moments of uncertainty, I could put on headphones and escape from this world, where everything was about death tolls and bed occupancy rates in intensive care units, where people died on the streets of Ecuador and doctors and nurses sobbed endlessly in Italy, a world fraught with tense anticipation of death and disease. Music stayed with me, but failed to bring back those who used to be by my side. I had never felt more alone. Nobody could share that loneliness with me because it was not the loneliness of compulsory isolation, anxiety, or even fear of the disease. It was the loneliness of having lost the world. I'm not talking about writer's block or blank page syndrome. In fact, I think I could have written something if someone had asked me. I did write some commissioned uh, pieces and continued working as a journalist. The work was there, unchanged and intact, but it meant nothing to me. It became mechanical, cold, and futile. I was supposed to write for the future, but I felt that the future was over. Now the unfathomable fear from the early days of the pandemic is gone, and there seems to be light at the end of the tunnel after many trials and errors. However, living in the present still feels unbearable at times. How did my room, my room wake up? How did the light come back?
As I ask myself again and try to reconstruct an answer, it is clear that the answer is reading. Reading is awakening. I forgot to mention that I used to be a bad reader, yet I never stopped reading. I did concentrate but lacked interest. Reading is the future. The books I read today were written long ago. I'm not sure if there's a direct relationship between the two. I open each book with a degree of sadness. Perhaps it's the feeling of a farewell. So reading awakened me. I don't remember which book in particular, or, or if there was only one. I do remember highlighting Bruce Chatwin's Chronicle, being moved by a passage written by Antonio Cisneros, and thinking I should be, use it as a title or a chapter heading later, and reading aloud such dazzling sentences from Toni Morrison's Beloved. One day I started cutting out weird stories from newspapers again. I re-watched 10 boring films just because I couldn't stop thinking about one particular actor who was young and beautiful and sometimes looked like a woman and sometimes looked like a demon. I went back to listening to music in bed and imagining all my characters having fun at a party and singing some silly wonderful songs from the 1980s like Gloria by Laura Branigan and Waterloo by ABBA. Writers like me who specialize in horror and the macabre have these fantasies, or maybe we are the ones who delve into them the most. Indeed, sometimes at these imaginary parties, the guests are all vampires, I must admit. Here in Buenos Aires, Argentina, the pandemic is ongoing. The relationship with my body and with the others has changed. And I don't think it'll ever be the same again. It will have an impact on my writing in the future. In what ways? I don't know yet. The trauma is in the early stage. It may leave a scar, a tattoo, or some other indelible mark. I'm curious about the outcome of the change, but I'm also scared of it. Every day, I wonder if writing is worthwhile. It's one of the most obvious differences before and after the outbreak of the pandemic. I'd never asked myself that before. I love to write, and some people enjoyed my works. What else could I ask for? To this day, I don't think my books are essential or important. I do wonder for what or whom I write. I believe that only the virus and the change in our ways of being in the world and in our language can transform literature. One older writer once told me that the 1918 Spanish flu had left little literature and that almost no one had written about it, a case unlike any other plague in history. I don't know. I haven't looked into his claim yet, nor am I interested in refuting it. One day, I came across a story by Alice Munro in which one of the protagonists recovers from the Spanish flu. In what is probably not the most important part of the story, the protagonist leaves the hospital changed and goes back to work. She's a librarian. Even when the world outside gets caught up in a third wave, she refuses to close the library and continues to live among books. She is tormented by love and in her imagination, the books seem like coffins covered in dust. Yet she remembers the tulips that she once saw outside the window of the sanitarium and thinks about the handsome doctor with whom she couldn't help but fall in love. Although she is still weak, words come back to her and she opens her eyes. Thank you very much, Ms. Mariana Enriquez. So I was thinking the same thing while I was reading the text, but listening to you speak. It feels as if you are running across ice with high heels and breaking the ice to bring out the spring that is underneath. Now I would like to have a talk with the two writers. I have Ms. Hangang here next to me, and Ms. Mariana Enriquez is joining us virtually from Argentina. Could we first have the writers each say hello? And also please tell us how it feels to be part of the festival. Ms. Enriquez first. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me to this festival. It is a great honor for me to be a part of the Seoul International Writers' Festival and it is still, uh, it is especially a great uh, honor to be here with Han Gang, whom I deeply respect. Of course, it would have been better if we could meet in person. Uh, in fact, I have never visited Seoul before and I do 
you hope that someday I will have the chance to do so. During this pandemic, and I experienced some um, things similar to what uh, Han Gang mentioned, and actually writing and continuing writing is a very difficult thing to do during this challenge, and it makes us think a lot. So she has mentioned that um, she was not she was disappointed that she was not able to join us uh, in Seoul. But because we have this being live streamed on uh, YouTube, I think you can all enjoy this uh, very well, despite not being able to be here. I'd like to say hello to Ms. Hanga. It's been a while since I've last see, see you. Yes, hello. Thank you for inviting me to the Seoul International Writers Festival. And if it weren't for the pandemic, we would have so many writers flying over and staying in Seoul with us over a certain period. And we would have these discussions and talks and uh, coffee together and also meals together and we would have walks on the street together and I'm sorry that we're not able to do that but I'm happy that we can still meet and talk online especially that I can talk to Ms. Mariana Enriquez and I believe that there is 12 hours uh, different time difference between Argentina and Seoul and I think it's morning in Argentina and it's raining now here in Seoul. It was raining on my way here when I was in the taxi coming over here. So it was reminding me of the atmosphere, the ambience of one of your stories. So I like to say that I'm very happy to meet you. Thank you very much, Ms. Han. So that exchange between the two writers already seems like the beginning of a big bang. So we don't know what writers have within, but we are looking for the ways to their uh, inner thoughts through their writing. And now we had heard about how you are uh, thinking about awakening in relation to the pandemic, and I'd like to ask Ms. Enriquez, what did you think about Ms. Han's uh, keynote lecture? In one perspective, Han, as defined by Han Gang, awakening. Is of course uh, something that is quite personal, and it's also very closely connected to works of literature. But what I want to ask. Uh, you know, there are things that happen externally, and there are also internal things that ex that you experience as you write. So how do you distinguish between those two? In the early part of your speech, you talked about how people were walking in the street and you were observing them, and you described them quite um in great detail. And in Argentina, of course, the environment and the pandemic itself has had a huge impact on our uh, writers and the way we write. As you have mentioned, Seoul International Writers Festival is a very important. My home is a little distance away from Buenos Aires, and we are suffering from a significant economic and political um, challenge at this time across the country in Argentina. And through the pandemic, we have come to take a fresh look at ourselves.
Creo que un, incluso una especie de conexión, and this profound eh, change otros, uh, was described very well by Han Gang in her keynote speech and the connection between myself and others and the connection between my body and uh, the body of others. I think all of uh, that has really changed because of the pandemic. And your works talk a lot about the body and the self, so I think you understand what I'm trying to say. Thank you very much. So, Ms. Han, would you have anything to say on Ms. Enrique's lecture? Yes, thank you. So, listening to Ms. Mariana Enrique's lecture, I was thinking that the pan yes, she said that the pandemic had put out the light in the room of her mind, and I was very intent on trying to find out what would happen next. And I was very uh, relieved, and I also empathized with her very much that reading had brought that light back in, brought back on in her mind. So not only in times of the pandemic, but even when we are faced with times when we cannot write, we can still read. Before we are writers, we are inherently readers, and no one can take away the act of reading from us. So through the act of reading, I am very happy to hear that that light has come back on in your room, and so many characters have come back to that room, including ghosts, and I'm happy to hear that you are writing again, and I hope to see your writing further again in Korea as well. Thank you very much. If I may, I would also like to ask a question, and this is maybe a common question for you both. Uh, you talked about a changed state. Uh, you talked about picking up a book after a change. Well, there's the room, uh, there's our mind and our body, and uh, there was the book, and there is this metaphor that's connected uh, to the concept of change of all these elements. So through the pandemic, uh, what kind of changes uh, do you think we have? The writer, writers often understand change and also a change state very well. And when I sit down to write, and when I come into a state of being obsessed with something, I, as a writer, experience transformation. And this transformation sometimes involves change in my bodily state. Because once I start writing, sometimes I don't really uh, recognize the flow of time, even for hours. And in that sense, we are almost transforming into a different self. And so the writer in the process of writing is deeply transformed. And I become not myself, but a different self. It is very difficult to define who that is. And I would like to thank Han Gang uh, for encouraging me for having gotten this sense of the desire to write back. And uh, in fact, I have this desire to write again, and I am trying not to get occupied by the external happenings. And I want to continue to concentrate uh, myself on writing. Now, if I 
to talk about change in a broader sense. I think we are passing through something, so we should not rush ourselves. We do not know in what way we will be transformed and what the outcome of that change will be. Instead of feeling rushed, we should recognize that we are in the midst of a change, and if you are in the midst of a change, just experience it, feel it, and just live it. I think that is what's important. The situation that will unfold after the change, that will come, but let's not rush ourselves to predict what that is. I think we need to learn to live with such change. Thank you very much. Uh, she talked about being open to change. So, Ms. Hanga, as far as I understand, the new times that are coming towards us, they will not be built by theories or certain established discourses, but I believe that your lecture was about going back to our own place as human beings to think about what we will do for the future. Could you please elaborate on that further? Yes, when I was writing this manuscript, I was very taken aback by that phrase that was written above the sign of the old bookstore, you'll find a way in books. So this phrase we've seen so many times since we were young, but I was suddenly mesmerized by that sentence and I was drawn into the bookstore and I was thinking over that sentence again and again for the following days. So what would be the way that we are looking for? Perhaps it might be the power of an attitude. And Ms. Mariana Enriquez said that writers and herself are changing and transformed as they write. And I believe the same thing happens when we are reading literature. So even if it's not trying to make a point, if the book delves into the inner workings of a human being's mind, or if it deals with musicality, we are impacted by the attitude and the uh, energy within that book, and we are re-energized and revitalized, and we are changed and transformed after we have read that book, and we change our attitude to our life in general. And the things that we have been experiencing recently, no one had expected them. In other words, we have learned for the first time that whatever, no matter what we are faced with in the future, we have learned that these things can happen. So we are at a crossroads in a sense. And I was asking myself, how much stronger should we become to face all of these uh, changes? And we will have to transform ourselves, and we have to have very much inner strength to weather those changes. Thank you very much. So both writers were speaking about reading books, reading and writing books. Then a book could be a pillar or a reference point. And based on that uh, book, we might be able to weather the storms that we might face going forward. Is that correct? I hope that I sort of summarized your uh, comment, Ms. Enriquez. Yes. Myself and Han Kang have I think spoken uh, something very similar, although our words may have differed. Reading, we often think of as a tool for looking into the future and also for making sense of the present. Books 
and events like Seoul International Writers Festival. Uh, this is taking place, and I'm in Argentina, and uh, you are in Seoul uh, with a 12-hour time difference. And through these events, we are in this moment highlighting the importance of books more than ever. And writers have gone through a lot of experiences, uh, different experiences, and they have written about them in their books. And we have talked about globalization uh, for a long time. And we often focused our discussion of globalization on economic aspects. But through the pandemic, we have a shared experience globally. But the impact has been quite diverse across the world. So while we have the same pandemic affecting us, we have had different experiences, and it is important for us to share those different experiences and through language and through imagination and through culture. We, and also through literature, we have realized that we have different views on the pandemic. And I think we really need to engage in a more active exchange. Of course, it's not very easy. Uh, and, and the kind of exchange I'm talking about is not just uh, an exchange between the writers. I am talking about an exchange that involves the whole of the public, uh, the publishing industry. And I am very curious about the things that happen other on the other side of the world to the people living on the other side of the planet. So we really need to be open to each other, to different places, to different regions, and also to literary works from different parts of the world. And I think this is very important. Thank you very much. I really do want to continue listening to Ms. Enrique's a very insightful answer. Uh, I mean, my takeaway is that we often talk about the globalization, focusing on economics, but uh, we actually have had a very shared uh, experience globally uh, during this pandemic, at the same time having experiences that are very diverging. Now, I think um, this was very insightful, and I know um, I'm not a very good summarizer, but anyhow, we will now look into the works of these two writers. Preparing for the festival, we asked the writers to choose one of their work to share with the readers in the festival. And Ms. Hangang chose her short story, Hunsa, and Ms. Mariana and Enriquez chose her short story, The Inn. Our readers can find the English and Korean ebooks on the Seoul International Writers Festival official website. This question is for Ms. Han first. Hunsa is the text that we are looking at, and I'm asking the question like an elementary school student. I thought there were many interesting angles. So there's a world that we yearn for. And Sometimes that world change and that that the world that we yearn for changes and that can uh, visualize, that can put into visuals how we are changing. And so could you please elaborate further on that point, on um, the motivation behind your reading, writing this story? So the elementary school kid inside me can understand. So when I was writing this, I have only driven three years in my life. Now I've sold my car and I don't drive. And this book was, the story was written when I was a driver. And when I was driving, I imagined of a woman who was dreaming of Hunza every day. So Hunza is a beautiful, uh, far away place in Pakistan. So it was sort of a haven that she was dreaming of, but 
She finds later in an advertisement that Hunza is becoming damaged and it is breaking down, just like this world and just like her own life. And the protagonist later comes to imagine a Hunza that is not that Hunza. So Hunza, the meaning of Hunza for the protagonist, keeps on changing. So. So there's the Hunza that the woman is imagining and her struggle to try to go forward. And in the very last scene in the story, this comes from my actual experience. So there are white lines that delineate the lanes on a highway, but those lines were all erased when I was driving and it was not very well lighted and I was driving at night, so it was very dangerous. So I was slowing down, and then all of the cars were also slowing down because they were uh, frightened because of the uh, environment. And we were all relying on our headlights to try not to crash into each other. I remember that instance when we were all slowing down, trying not to crash into each other. And I was trying to imagine the protagonist, her um, emotional state. And the overarching theme of this year's festival is awakening. And I believe that everyone today is in the dark and everyone is slowing down and they're trying to grope in the darkness, trying to find out what they are facing. And I thought it was very similar that the times that we are facing today to the situation of the woman in my story. <laughs> Don't you plan to drive again? No, I don't. Well, reading your story, even the headlight and the light seems to be an extension of the body. And I was thinking about a sense of complicity, so about the wildcat that was killed, the road kill. It gave a sense of complicity and being an accomplice. But in other words, it's also sort of a solidarity. and. So it seems to show a connection. Correct. Uh, the woman is part of that world, and Hunza keeps on changing within this world, and it's being damaged. And Hunza is struggling, and the woman is also struggling, and they're connected in their struggle. Well, thank you so much. I am really sorry that we're not able to go deeper into that discussion. Uh, Ms. Enriquez, I really enjoyed reading uh, the end. I think there are fears that uh, exist inside us, and they stem from our personal experience, but also from the broader social experience, and these horrors reside us, hide in us, and you have descri described those horrors uh, by using metaphors like the chorizo uh, under the mattress. And I was very um, interested in reading uh, about this. And so these are hidden inside us. But uh, you, instead of unraveling this one by one, you sort of just went bang into this shocking experience all at once. And um, that was quite um, interesting to me. And is there a reason why you wrote in that fashion? I sometimes think that the reality cannot be told as a story. I see we can't just rely on realism to describe reality, and I feel that we need a different language, and that is the language of fantasy. The absurdity of the external world, the abnormal abnormality and the trauma, and also the social trauma that is a legacy to us. And there are scars that we have inherited uh, you know, from generations above us. And in Argentina, there are many problems that are passed down to the generations that come after generations. So there is inequality, there's violence. These are all large problems. 
and such inequalities and problems have been repeating themselves over and over again, and they reappear in our realities time and time again. And by recapturing this in fantastic language, I think we can capture them more tellingly. And I think, of course, this is because I'm a writer. And of course, I am writing in the home of uh, Borges in Argentina. So for me, reality and uh, fantasy uh, are something that can be combined and mixed, and for me this comes naturally. It almost seems normal. Uh, it's, it's an accepted uh, approach of writing in Argentina. Of course, this approach can be used in different genres of literature and also the films I've watched and the books that I've, I've read must have influenced me also uh, from a very young, uh, from, a young uh, from my, my time as a young child. Uh, I've always been fascinated with the language of fantasy more so than reality. Thank you very much for that response. Uh, in in the description uh, of the headlight uh, beaming into the window, I felt like you know those headlights were actually uh, beaming into my face. And I think this kind of fantastic uh, elements were very compelling in your uh, stories. Now this ends uh, my question. Perhaps you can exchange questions. Uh, first, uh, if Ms. Han has any questions for Ms. Enriquez's story. Yes, in your story, there seem to deal with dead people in a very familiar way. And you said earlier that the language of fantasy is something more ordinary and something more familiar to yourself. Then I would like to know how familiar, how close do you feel with those souls and dead people? How uh, close do you feel they are next by you? That is a rather difficult question to answer. In a way, it has a lot to do with our history. I was born in the 70s. At the time, there was a dictatorship, a military dictatorship in Argentina, and many people were killed um, during the 70s. And the methods of killing were very explicitly uh, for example, there were many people who were kidnapped, disappeared, and they reappeared later as dead bodies. And this happened quite openly. And this experience, well, actually, I was very young at the time, so for me, it didn't seem very much like reality, but over time, I think I grappled with that by mixing it with language of fantasy. And through this experience, I was able to uh, look at the dead from a more intimate point of view. And I started writing as a young girl. And I participated in human rights demonstrations. 
And when I participated, there were photos being held up by the protesters of their beloved dead or disappeared. Of course, uh, such activities are political. But from a personal point of view, the dead people and the spirits of the dead are very uh, are special to me, uh, thanks to experiences like the one I've just mentioned. And we've been talking about reading and how we can transform ourselves through reading, all of us, of course there are differences in culture, but all of us sometimes see death as uh, something of a taboo that we should shy away from and refrain from talking about openly. And oftentimes, we tend to want to erase things that we cannot effectively prevent. And I have grown up and am still living in an environment that has uh, this view. And I personally feel very close to the dead. However, there are certain genres that deal better uh, with the dead. Thank you very much for that answer. So the question probably stemmed from some memories that you carry from reading earlier uh, work. And there's also a certain tone that we can perceive in the way you answer it. We can hear the uh, past scars that you have suffered. Though we are in the midst of a festival, I believe that we have to bring those memories back and discuss them. So we are not only sharing spaces, but also sharing different times in history. And thank you very much for those very important questions and answers. So Ms. Enriquez, do you have a question for Han Gang? Uh, you could ask about Hunza, or you could also ask about other works of Han Gang that you have read. I would actually like a question uh, that is more general in nature. Ms. Kang uh, must have a way in which she writes, and so I wanted to ask about that and how she was able to concentrate during the pandemic on writing. And I wanted to find out about the process of writing for Han Gang, uh, how she gets her ideas, uh, does she find inspirations from images in her daily lives, and where do you get the energy to write? So it seems like she wants you to disclose your trade secrets. Well, earlier in Ms. Enriquez's answer, I could understand how you feel so familiar and close with dead people and dead souls. Human acts and my more recent work, I do not bid farewell. I believe that I went through the same uh, process as you did while I was writing those books. I felt very close to dead souls, and I still do feel that sense. So I believe that this will continue to be a very important theme for my writing, and that's why I asked you that question. I would like to express my appreciation for your uh, very kind answer. And in the midst of the pandemic, I have been writing and I've published a book. And the reason behind that is, fortunately, I'm not quite sure if I should say that I was fortunate. But anyway, I had written the first half of this I Do Not Bid Farewell before the pandemic broke out. So with half of the book left to write, the 
pandemic struck. And I, so I was already geared up and I was able to uh, make use of the momentum that I already had to continue to write to the end of the book. So I was having a balancing act between two worlds. I had one year open to see what is happening around in the world. I was wondering what was happening and I was very heartbroken by what was happening. But at the same time, I was able to continue to write things to the momentum that I already had. If the pandemic had uh, begin, begun before I had begun writing my book, then I would have been lost and the light in the room of my mind would also might have gone out. But anyway, I had written half of it and um, if the libraries closed down, then of course I had to uh, buy books to read and research for the latter half of my book. And it's not really there a trade secret, but I had luckily written already half of my book before these times had hit us. And when I'm writing, images are very important for my writing. So the dreams that I had dreamt or the questions that I continuously ask or my past experiences, sometimes they all come together in some instances. And sometimes that might materialize into a story. And I would contemplate that story until the images become much more clear and pronounced. Thank you very much. So I'm not sure if that answered the question. Perhaps we wanted to delve a little bit deeper. Yes, we were talking earlier about the room of the mind. And uh, Ms. Enriquez, perhaps you could share a trade secret of your own as a writer? Well, it's not much of a secret, to be honest. When I write a short story and when I write a full-length novel, I write quite differently. Uh, generally, my short stories have been published in Korea, but prior to the break outbreak of the pandemic, in regards to the novel and also uh, in regard to the journalism, I've been quite busy, but with the pandemic breaking out, all of that just stopped. And of course, this might not be very relevant to uh, the topic of literature, but anyway, when I earlier mentioned that I approach it very differently when I'm writing um, short stories and writing full-length novels. When it comes to short stories, I actually sort of write it out in my head. The story is already planned out fully in my head before I start writing. Of course, when I'm revising it, sometimes it takes as many as much time as months, but Generally, I impulsively think about what to write in my head, and my short stories are written in a relatively short period of time. But a full-length novel is quite different. I sometimes feel like I'm entering a world that is unknown to me, and I must be very flexible. And I start out by looking at this different world, and I feel uh, that the image before me is quite vague, and I'm uncertain of what I'm viewing, and that's how I begin. And as I write, I develop this world further and further. In my case, I feel bored quite uh, quickly, so I often like to give, uh, um, a lot, make a lot of changes in the approach of writing. And 
As if I'm traveling to different places, I change my writing style or approach in my head. This is not much of a trade secret, but this is the way I write. I don't write poetry per se, although I want to try writing poetry, but uh, the metaphysical and the abstract are quite challenging and unapproachable for me. Someday I might write poetry, though. Uh, because of time, I think the organizers are very uh, you know, mindful of time management, but I think uh, this kind of discussion is really engaging, but we do need to move along quite uh, quickly. And of course, I want to talk about poetry a little bit, but that will have to wait for the next opportunity. Uh, we have a lot of participants joining us from online, and we would like to give uh, those readers a chance to ask questions. And uh, anyone has a question for Ms. Enriquez? Please raise your hand, and I will call out to you. Oh, yes, you are Che Jin Young. Well, can you please introduce yourself briefly and ask your question to uh, Ms. Enriquez? Hello, I am studying uh, Spanish translation at LTI Korea. And I really enjoyed reading Things We Lost in Fire, which was published last year. And the story with the same, same title resonated with me strongly because it reminded me of a very tragic event in modern Korean history. So my question is this, when we read stories, we sometimes encounter disturbing scenes of violence that clash with our ethics and morals, and this makes us uncomfortable. While depicting the same kind of violent scenes, some works use them as a critique on the system of violence and inequality, while others will use them to defend it. Then there are still others that do neither, that just observe what's happening from a point of neutrality. What do you think is the element that makes this difference? And what principles do you think the writer needs to have in order to avoid creating works that at minimum does not contribute to solidifying the system of violence and inequality? In addition, when we encounter scenes in fiction that offend our sense of morals and ethics and make us uncomfortable, how should we as readers deal with this discomfort? Thank you very much for that question. I would have to apologize to the readers because, you know, it's such an insightful um, question. You know, I, I wasn't prepared to ask such a question of death, but uh, we have wonderful readers uh, joining us. Thank you very much for that wonderful question. No work of literature should solidify violence and inequality. I don't think any literary work actually does that. Maybe political pamphlets might, but literature and writers of literature look out into the world and they look at inequality, injustice, and they look at the everyday life. And of course, there are writers of pamphlets, and there are people who write from a political agenda. But if we do not have such agenda, uh, you know, writers of literature probably do not solidify or contribute to violence and inequality. It is actually a topic that I often reflect on. Violence and inequality are very closely connected to reality. Uh, literature tends to uh, euphemize and romanticize and so it's not necessarily all based on reality. And 
Many people ask me, how is it that you write about such violent things? But I don't write about something that does not exist. I write about things that I have seen in reality. But when people read in writing what they actually witness in reality, they feel this is this comes to them in a more powerful way. Writers sometimes play the role of disturbing the readers, and by disturbing the readers, they encourage the readers to think more deeply. And because of this, I believe uh, what's written should be read as writing. Of course, writing can lead to some change in your inner being. And if you feel that uh, a work of literature is too disturbing, too uncomfortable for you, then you may stop reading. Uh, in the case of my mother, she often tells me my work is too strong and too intense. Well, if you feel that way, you can stop reading. And sometimes she says it's too horrible or, or horrific to read. But I think the writer needs to be true to what he or she is writing. And again, writer does not uh, solidify violence and inequality, they should deal uh, with uh, such hard topics in their writing. So yes, writing includes, and literature also includes, the tasks and challenge of sociology and also uh, aesthetics. So I hope that answer fully answers your question. Yes, very much. Thank you so much for that answer. And then, could we have a question for Ms. Hangang? Could you please raise your hand if you have a question? Because the other people have their names in English, I would like to uh, point out Jasmine Kevin. Hello, I am in the LTI Korea Translation Academy, French major and also Korean literature doctoral degree candidate at the Academy of Korean Studies. My name is Jasmine Kevin. I enjoyed reading Hunza very much, and after reading Hunza and listening to your lecture, I felt they both speak about a way or road. In Hunza, there is a prison-like way for women prescribed by society that contrasts with the way to escape into a fantasy. That place at the end of the road, Hunza, is a fictitious place only existing in the protagonist's mind. And then, when I heard your lecture, I got to think about the way that we are looking for. If literature does hold a way for us, then amidst all this heightened sense and need for entertainment, are we able to find that way and walk the line? Does fiction, which is inherently fictitious, really hold the way for us who live in reality? Maybe that way or road is only a fantasy, just like the fantasy destination of Hunza in your story. And I fear for that. And I would like to know what you, a reader of literature, a prominent figure in the literary community, and a renowned fiction writer, really believe. Thank you so much. So the destination in the story and also the reality was touched upon in that question. Thank you very much for that question. So yes, the way or the road that is described in Hunza is not a peaceful, enjoyable way. It's filled with pain. So a being that is tortured and torn is crawling along that way to Hunza. And I believe that the way that we travel in reality is quite similar to that. So about literature, 
I myself, when I'm in times of difficulty, I sometimes ask whether literature actually matters. But I always come back to my original position, and I really feel that literature does have a very unique power. And sometimes it is the only thing that can uplift us. And sometimes it brings us down to the very bottom of our consciousness. So I believe that the unique power and strength of literature is not a fantasy. And I was talking about attitude earlier. On a personal level, I have learned very much and I have changed very much through literature throughout my life. After reading a book, for example, that book, that work of literature had helped me pull myself together and give me more courage, or in some instances, it pushed me deeper into despair and pain. But then I came up to the surface again. And sometimes it brings me into a very quiet and silent world. And I am sometimes awakened from that world how and realize how violent the world that surrounds that, wor that piece of literature is. And so I am advancing forward with literature with its power. So I have confidence and a belief that the power of literature indeed is not a fantasy. I hope that answered your question. Did that answer your question, Jasmine? Yes, I could read lips and he says yes. It was a very good answer. So the answer that Ms. Han provided also ties in with our overarching theme. Literature doesn't show us the answer, but it gives us an awakening. It makes us reflect on things and think over things. That is the power of literature. Thank you very much, Ms. Han. Um, much as I would like to continue on with this discussion, because our time is up, I think we will have to wrap up this opening keynote lecture. However, one thing that I was wondering, Argentina uh, is probably in you know, the morning time of did you stay up all night or did you take some time to sleep uh, before joining us? I mean, you look very alert. And also, could you say a few words about how you enjoyed today? No, primero desayuné. I actually had breakfast and had a cup of coffee as well. And I did not just get up right before the festival. I think I know where your question is coming from. As a writer, I have spent uh, at times, I have spent all night uh, awake and writing, but during the pandemic, I have tried to wake up very early in the morning to start the day early and write. And today, we have a very sunny and beautiful uh, spring morning. And I'm not the kind of a person who wakes up very early in the morning. Uh, it hasn't become a habit yet, but I try to get up at least by 7 and uh, at least by 8. So that was the trade secret. But anyway, thank you very much for letting us know how you begin your day. So thank you very much for participating and also giving the opening keynote lecture. Could we ask what you thought about being part of this festival opening? To Ms. Mariana Enriquez.
señora Han Kang, no, soy, no, soy yo, ¿no? Es, es para mí. Eh, estoy, eh, no, estoy muy contenta. Oh, was that question directed to me? De lo que, de, de, oh, de, de lo que I am very, I have... I'm very happy to be a part of this festival, and I think this is actually more comfortable than I had expected. I often uh, feel very tense when I participate in a writer's festivals like this, but today I really enjoyed uh, this time together with you, and it was very comfortable the whole time. And and it was great to see that the readers also participated and also very sharp and insightful questions were shared by the readers and for that I am very uh, happy and grateful. And I hope that in the future I could have an opportunity to meet Han Gang in person, maybe share a meal together and uh, walk in the streets together sometime in the future. After this festival uh, or today's session is over, we will probably return to our own lives and engage in the everyday life that we have. And I think it's very important for us writers to have had this opportunity to engage deeply with the readers. And I hope that when we get a chance to meet in person, it would be great to do so. Uh, in a more intimate way. And although we cannot see uh, each other in person, it felt very close nevertheless. Thank you very much. Uh, talking about uh, sharing meals and drinks with readers and writers, it gets me all so excited. Uh, so I would like to ask Ms. Han what it felt like being part of this festival and what time do you get up and go to bed? Oh, actually, I go to bed about 11 p.m. And in the morning, I get up at around 6 a.m. So this is a habit since I was a child. Oh, so you've been keeping to that schedule throughout your life. I, yes, I'm used to it, and I might actually get up earlier going forward. And how did you feel being part of this uh, session? Yes, as was mentioned earlier, we haven't been able to shake hands, we haven't been able to hug each other, and we haven't been able to share a meal or tea or coffee, and we haven't been able to take a stroll on the streets together. However, we were able to fulfill our wish to be connected today. And as Ms. Enrique said, I also felt very close and comfortable in this meeting, and I will remember this experience for a long while. And I do hope that we will be able to meet in person someday. It was a great pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Han and Ms. Enriquez. Please give the two writers a big hand. So listening to the voice of writers, not just reading them through text, but meeting them through their voice gives us a feeling that the soul might be contained in their voices. And it was quite an honor for me to be part of this talk. So I am sure this has made an unforgettable event for every participant. A big thank you to the writers who have shared with us such a rich discussion as we bid them goodbye. So that brings us to the end of the opening keynote lecture of 2021, Seoul International Writers' Festival. We have kicked off the global festival of literature for writers and readers with a bay. In the midst of all the disheartening news and anxiety in the prolonged pandemic, I hope literature and talks about literature has given us more hope for the future. Uh, next year, I hope the 2022 festival will welcome writers from around the world here in Seoul to meet with readers in person with even more exciting and rich discussions. With that, I end the session. I am the poet Shin Yong-mok. Thank you so much for joining us.